Thank you very much for coming. This talk is going to be about um, three general topics, computer vision, surveillance, and camouflage. Um, if you've been to Gatwick Airport recently, you may have seen one of these. Um, what it is is a facial recognition system that's designed to improve the flow of traffic around airports. According to their website, the system is designed to capture passengers' facial features as they enter the airport and tracks them throughout their journey. Um, it claims 10 times the capture rate of device tracking solutions, such as tracking the MAC address of your Wi-Fi if you leave that on at the airport. And the passenger, of course, never needs to switch on the technology because your face, they say, is always on. Uh, the, comp the company is interesting, but not very unique. They're part of a larger, rapidly evolving industry of human analytics. And on their website, you'll see this statistic where they mention that 89% of people are willing to give up their biometric information as they travel through international borders. Um, this is a statistic that you would likely see on a biometric industry website. However, this is a statistic that you would not likely see. And this is a, a view from a study by Accenture that says 75% of respondents um, would not even shop in a store that uses facial recognition for marketing purposes. And while uh, these cameras certainly look uh, new and innovative, face detection and face recognition uh, is certainly not anything new. In fact, the history of face detection begins around 1969, when three Japanese researchers published a, a research paper um, proving that a computer could be used to detect a human face. And it looked something like this. Um, what you see is basically edge detection being used to trace the outline of human silhouette. Being able to match that unique silhouette to the silhouette of a human was what led to the first face being detected. Um, following that breakthrough in 1969, in the early 70s, the researcher at Stanford um, followed by another researcher uh, at a Japanese university, published the first research that showed how to do facial landmark tracking, being able to detect the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and the shape of the head. And so this facial landmarking is what's used today by Facebook or other companies to do high-performance facial recognition. And you can see in this image how this algorithm in 1973 was able to segment the eye, the lips, and the nose. And if we compare this number from 1973 of about 75% accuracy to the numbers in 2016, um, it's interesting to note that computers are now at around 98.5% um, success in recognizing and classifying humans. But meanwhile, humans are stuck at 97.53. And in 2017, that number for humans is going to stay the same, and the number for computers on the bottom is going to keep increasing. So certainly, um, heading into 2016, it's an interesting year and exciting for facial recognition. But that really depends on where you're standing, and that depends on whether you're someone using facial recognition to collect or process information, or if you're somebody that's being watched by it. I want to note two um, toolkits that have been recently released. They're both called Open Face, but they're a little bit different. The one on the left is a, a deep neural network that uses, um, I think it gets between about 97 or 98 
uh, percent success with classifying faces. It's completely free. The one on the right is used for behavior analysis. So while the one on the left is used to read the outside of you, to use you as an index to your identity, the one on the right reads the inside of you. Um, it reads your emotional state. Both of these could be deployed for the cost of a Raspberry Pi kit, so around $50 to implement um, a very high-performance facial recognition system in 2016. But this line actually comes from a marketing newsletter from marketingland.com. They're also very excited about facial recognition because in the marketing business, one of the problems is that people like to pay in cash. Um, I noticed here in, in Berlin especially, a lot of things are a cash business. You can't track that. Facial recognition changes that. And what marketers are doing right now is using facial recognition to make it possible to track cash purchases. When you think about the history of facial recognition, how it was originally funded by the Department of Defense for military purposes, specifically to locate enemy combatants and criminals, that same technology is now being used to identify and track consumers who do not pay with a trackable form of payment, a credit card. Um, that's not great. Now, I wanted to provide a quick overview of some of the capabilities in computer vision um, that have become very easy to deploy on anything as simple as a Raspberry Pi surveillance system. The first one is using uh, gender and age detection, although you can see that it's not 100% accurate. Um, it's open source and accessible to anyone. Another one is called gaze detection. And gaze detection looks at what you're looking at. So if there's a photo of you, this algorithm will be able to tell what you find interesting in that photo. And then you can drive analytics, and you can understand the scene from doing that. Um, building off gaze detection, you can do something called um, finding important people in images. So when you know who's looking at who, you can start to determine the social order of a group of people in photos. This is a image from a company called Jetpack. And what they're doing is using every public pixel of Instagram to build tour guides for cities. And what you see here is that they're, they're looking at cues like facial hair, hipster mustaches, and lipstick. And they use this visual information to, uh, say, if you're visiting a city, guide you to a place where there's a, a high concentration of hipsters with facial hair, or a place where a lot of uh, girls are hanging out with lipstick. And so when you post photos online in social media, um, these, these social media posts are really the superfood of artificial intelligence. These are feeding the algorithms that are being trained to then, for example, sell products back to you or provide um, kind of gated levels of access with facial recognition technologies. This is one that I came across on uh, Reddit, I think, and somebody was bragging about how they use computer vision, um, which is that they scan Facebook profile photos for overweight people, store their IDs, and then target ads to them on Facebook. Um, I'll provide just another one. Uh, this is a company called Affectiva that claims to have the uh, world's largest emotion database with 40 billion emotion data points and nearly 4 million faces analyzed. Compare that to the NSA. Affectiva is scanning about 5.5 thousand faces per day, whereas you look at a report by Laura Poitras and James Risen from the Snowden documents, NSA comparatively is scanning 55,000 faces a day. So we see these um, 
commercial surveillance companies are nearly on the same playing field as government agencies. As I said, you can now use this facial expression analysis to read um, sort of the inside, to read the thoughts of somebody, to know what they're thinking, or to profile their emotions. And these read a set of things called facial action units. One of them is called lip suck, or jaw drop, or blink. Every facial movement can be read and analyzed. So I wondered what would happen if I ran this on a video. Just, just one, Madam, Madam Chair, and I, I thank you. Of and the just Senate for you Intelligence to Committee. Again on the surveillance front, and I hope we can do this in just a yes or no answer because I know Senator Feinstein wants to move on. Last summer, the NSA director was at a conference, and he was asked a question about the NSA surveillance of Americans. He replied, and I quote here. The story that we have millions or hundreds of millions of dossiers on people is completely false. The reason I'm asking the question is having served on the committee now for a dozen years, I don't really know what a dossier is in this context. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not. Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently... Hurt. So, a lot of these algorithms are about 90 to 98 percent accurate, but I'm pretty convinced that this one is just about perfect. However, reading it from another angle, another perspective, gives you a different answer. And it goes from joy to disgusted. I want to uh, bring attention to, as I mentioned, um, comparing commercial surveillance to government surveillance. And they're really not that different. And kind of, they actually are the same thing sometimes. This highlighted text is from a company called PitPat. Um, who is, has offered a blanket license to the United States government. PitPat is notable because that's the facial recognition company that was sold to Google, and that's the one that the NSA is using to scan um, facial faces that are intercepted from communications. So what I think is that a face is one of the most powerful tools for communication yet there are very few, if any, acceptable ways to protect it from dubious or invasive kinds of surveillance. And six years ago, I started working on a project called CV Dazzle as my thesis at NYU and made this sketch to see if it was possible to make some kind of hair and makeup um, appearance that would block face detection. And it came out looking like this. You can see um, each look is unique, but each look works in the same way to block the face from being detected. None of the faces in these images are apparent to a computer vision algorithm. Yet to a human, it's very obvious that there's a person here. And that's, that's the key to this project, is to explore this very fine line between what can a computer see, what can a, a human see, and of course, what's socially acceptable. And I think there's a very, there's a very fine line in between all of those overlapping circles um, for the right occasion, of course. So really the definition is that CV Dazzle is a kind of camouflage uh, from computer vision. And it uses these bold pattern um, and hairstyles to kind of break apart the most important facial features that are targeted by face detection algorithms. The dazzle part of it comes from this kind of camouflage that was first introduced in World War I on ships called dazzle, which interestingly was really inspired by Picasso's cubism. And the way that it worked is if you were launching ammunition at this ship, it's difficult to tell sometimes whether it's one ship, two ships, whether it's going left or right. And the idea is to confuse the observer by using this bold patterning to kind of break apart the gestalt of the object. So 
you know, similarly with these computer vision algorithms, um, they can be reverse engineered to see what they're thinking about. And this is a um, genetic algorithm reverse engineering process of OpenCV's um, Hauer Cascade algorithm. But what's important is that you can see that in the heat map, there are some parts of the face that are more important than others. And with this information, then you can begin to design a camouflage pattern that would target those, those most salient um, parts of the image. If we look closer, these are the faces that are hidden inside some of the face detection algorithms. Kind of a ghoulish looking ghost in the machine. And that's the frontal face profile, and that's the profile face. So I can give you some tips on what works and what doesn't work. Uh, what does work is creating asymmetry on the face, um, using dark hair against light skin or light hair against dark skin, um, altering the contrast uh, and the darkness of the cheekbone area, and a very important area is the nose bridge or the area between the eyes, kind of a centroid of the face. In, uh, I think, 2014, the New York Times commissioned uh, new looks, and these were um, developed to be a little bit um, better performing, adapted to some of the newer algorithms, and I'll show you kind of how these are measured. But I think first, I um, need to show you a ground truth to show what a face looks like when it's detected and how easy it is to detect. So the red areas um, show an area that is detected by the face detection algorithm. And for comparison, if you're doing military camouflage and have paint all over your face, that doesn't mean that you're going to block face detection because it's a specific application to those targeted um, highly sensitive areas of the face. So when we run that same saliency test on the images commissioned for the New York Times, you can see that there are no positive detections. Um, and the, the different rectangles represent each of the five uh, face detection profiles. So on this one, it's also it's working well, but you can see that one of them, one of the five detectors, does see it. And it's important to consider camouflage not as something that makes you invisible. I think that's the way it's often written about in headlines. But camouflage is really the idea that you're understanding the threshold of detection and then creating some way of appearing that lowers you just one step below that threshold of detection. And that's done by an analysis of, with computer vision, the specific algorithm that you're targeting. Um, since 2010, which is a while ago now, uh, some interesting things have happened. Putting it online, there's been uh, a few articles. Somebody said that they saw a young woman with anti-computer vision, anti-surveillance makeup, first sighting in the wild for him anti-surveillance feminist poetry hair and makeup party. Uh, the band Big Data used it for one of their promos. There have been art and science festivals, like on the bottom right, that have done it. And everyone interprets it um, kind of in their own way. And just using the tips on the website, are able to construct um, unique camouflage designs that actually block you know, millions of dollars worth of face detection. Um, and sometimes it's just beyond my control what happens. This <laughs> appeared in as a TV show called Elementary. And in one of the scenes, this um, you know, uh, criminal type character was trying to evade face detection. And so they created this look, um, which, is, which is quite colorful. Um, but it's interesting because it does function, it does work. And in other popular culture references, the TV show Minority Report, not the movie, imagined that in the future, 
I think it's the year 2065, people would wear this ironically, kind of as a throwback to the past when it was so easy to block face detection that all you had to do was use makeup. And so this becomes kind of like a tattoo that maybe you regret when it's 2060 <laughs> because it only functioned uh, 40, 50 years ago. Some of the examples that I've shown would probably be more suitable for going out at night to a club, but it's worth pointing out that it can look pretty good. This is not something that I was involved with. This is just an example of a hairstyle that happens to work well. So, with the right hairstylist and makeup artist, you can go places with it. Um, I want to shift now to a more recent project that I worked on starting in 2012. And this project is about drone surveillance, but in particular, military drones. And the capability of thermal imaging systems like, like this, which is a um, camera payload on the bottom of a drone with multispectral imaging capabilities. And one of those imaging capabilities is seeing in the dark or seeing the radiation, uh, the thermal radiation that's emitted from your body. And it's quite hard to uh, think of yourself as always visible, even if you're hiding, say, in a forest undercover. Uh, you could still be detected. And I thought um, that poses a future threat to privacy, and this is a, quite a powerful technology. I wonder if it is really uh, unstoppable. And researched ways that maybe the thermal energy could be blocked, and in 2013 released a series of garments called Stealthware. These are garments that are designed with a metal-plated fabric, and the metal is typically silver, so it's highly flexible. And you can see in these images that the metal-plated fabrics um, reduce the thermal signature or entirely black out that part of the body. Here's an example of somebody wearing it, and you can see that there are four people but there are actually five. Um, the projector makes it hard to see, and once the individual starts moving, it'll become very apparent. But in this still image, um, somebody is blending in perfectly to the background in the winter, which is even more difficult because you have a higher temperature differential. So I'm gonna play it, and it's gonna be very obvious. Right. The, the intent is not to provide a full military solution, but to illustrate the possibility for a new type of fashion that's maybe more appropriate for an era of mass surveillance. And so there's a hoodie, and there's a burqa, and there's a hijab. And these items are, of course, inspired by Islamic dress. And the idea with this project is Whereas uh, religious dress is traditionally um, in some ways thought of as providing a separation between man and God, um, this collection of items in stealthware reimagines religious dress in the context of mass surveillance as providing a separation between man and drone. Some of the other more interesting things and slightly concerning were um, these emails and some articles that came out. So, of course, these, these projects kind of butt up against national security interests, which makes me, as an artist, um, sometimes quite uh, you know, aware of the possibility for that to go wrong. In 2013, I received an email for a request for publication in a classified int intelligence document, which was strange because I'm never gonna see that. Do you really need my permission? <laughs> Most uh, news publications don't even ask for it. And the other one was the Washington Post put a request for comment on the 
Office of the Director of National Intelligence uh, desk and for the NSA. I, I try to you know, create work that doesn't put me possibly at risk for who knows. The area of national security is sometimes black and white, and it's not, uh, it's not a very open area to art. But that's exactly why I'm doing these projects that I do. The other one that I'll point out is a tweet from the Air Force General Counsel at the Pentagon, just making note that they are aware of the idea of stealthware to hide from military drones. So I see this gray area where artists can operate as something that's very essential. Being able to not make um, projects that are threatening to, to any person in particular, but kind of give some room for us to think about the future that we're creating. And as a response to some of these anxiety-provoking emails that I received, the next project that I created was the Privacy Gift Shop, which is a way to make these sometimes uh, threatening ideas about national security a little bit more friendly. Because gift shops are always friendly, open, accessible, kind of safe places. The only difference is that this is a gift shop for counter surveillance, art, and privacy accessories. So I sell the items um, directly, and the anti-drone hoodie did quite well and sold out. Um, it is expensive, and I'm a terrible businessman because I'm going to tell you that you can also do that for less than one dollar. Um, the way that thermal radiation is blocked is by any kind of uh, garment or fabric that's thermally reflective or thermally insulating. And so the most obvious example it would be a space blanket. Uh, you can get a pack for your whole family for less than $10. And while that has the same uh, functional appeal to block thermal radiation, the main difference is in the psychology of camouflage. I'll just show quick that this is a, a space or mylar blanket, and that's um, how it works. So kind of to wrap things up in summary, that there are functional solutions to hiding and blocking surveillance, and there are more um, artistic or psychological responses, um, a more thought-out kind of camouflage. I think that when, when, we, when we think of camouflage, it's a woodland Vietnam-era M81 pattern, blotchy browns and greens and blacks. But really, camouflage didn't even really exist the way it does before the 20th century. And in the early 20th century, uh, camouflage was actually a term for criminals hiding from the police. I think you can draw a similarity, a parallel between the way that camouflage was thought of in the early 20th century to the way that privacy was thought of early in this century. And some other quotes from a fantastic book about camouflage and its impacts on Australia. Theodore Roosevelt considered camouflage as a form of effeminate cowardice, a mere defensive strategy. But then you'll see as World War II, as World War I and World War II unfolded, people came to realize the significance and the power, the strategic advantage, and most importantly, that camouflage became a sign of humanity's increasing intelligence. So I think that maybe privacy can be thought of in the same way, not as a defensive or cowardice response, but privacy is also something that shows humanity's increasing intelligence. And in closing, we think maybe these solutions are a little bit eccentric, but if you look back in history, the year 1918 in New York City, everybody is wearing a bowler cap. If you look around in the audience, actually there's one person that's not, but if you look around in the audience, nobody's wearing a bowler cap. So it's very, very possible 
for something that's completely normal to become abnormal, and likewise, possible for something that's very abnormal or eccentric now to become completely normal in the future. Thank you. So thank you, Adam.